Damon, thank you. We're about to hear from Governor Spencer Cox and his administration about the fight against COVID-19 here in Utah. In fact, he and other state leaders are briefing Utahns on the situation caused by Omicron. Let's go ahead and listen in. This is the Lieutenant Governor. Testing. There we go. Ah, much better. So uh, every day, my husband uh, sends me pictures or videos of the very long lines he finds as he as he goes around. Uh, he does home health, um, physical therapy in people's homes, and and so I see this. I know we've all experienced it. We all all see it, and and we want to address some of that today. Um, Employers throughout the state are having a difficult time keeping their businesses open as staff uh, become infected with COVID-19. And this includes our schools. Our schools are, are obviously having a, a real struggle right now as well. Um, we're struggling not only to keep kids in classrooms, but to keep teachers there. Um, over the past 36 hours, the governor and I have been working very closely with legislative leadership, with the speaker and the president and um, health leaders and uh, Superintendent Dixon. Um, and collectively, we've determined that uh, our response to COVID-19 right now uh, needs to change as uh, the virus has changed. We're dealing with something different now. We need new strategies. And so today, um, we want to present our plan to you, uh, our plan to deal with the current situation as Omicron uh, tears through our community. First, we're going to hear from Governor Cox. And then we will hear from uh, state epidemiologist, Dr. Leisha Nolan, and then uh, state superintendent, Dr. Sidney Dixon. And finally, we will hear from House Speaker uh, Brad Wilson. Um, would like to excuse President Adams. He feels bad he can't be here today, but I would like to acknowledge Senator Colomore here representing the Senate and uh, grateful to have his presence. Governor Cox. Thank you, Lieutenant Governor. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's, uh, we appreciate you being with us this morning. We appreciate the members of the media who have uh, been our partners in, in helping to get information out over the, uh, the past two years uh, with, this, uh, with this pandemic. So as, as Lieutenant Governor mentioned, and I'll, I'll share just a, a few uh, data points of which you were all tracking uh, very closely, um, average daily case counts since Christmas Day, we'll, we'll use that as kind of a baseline. Basically, Christmas Day is when we started to see Omicron um, overtake Delta and uh, and started to see these uh, these big spikes as as every uh, state has seen. Uh, average daily case counts since Christmas Day are up from uh, about 1,200 a day to more than 9,500. The percent positivity rate has gone from about 13.2% uh, up to 36.5%. The, the number of hospitalized cases has gone from 434 on Christmas Day to, uh, to 638 yesterday. And cases among school-aged kids has, has increased from about 150 per day uh, at Christmas time to, to about 3,000 uh, yesterday. So daily tests have increased from uh, 19,000 to almost 48,000 which uh, which is is why we're we're here and and having this this conversation of course, we've, we've all seen uh, stories in the media from our friends uh, of the, uh, the, the sometimes hours-long wait to get tested. The uh, COVID-19, as, as, uh, as, as Lieutenant Governor mentioned, the, uh, the virus has changed significantly. And this Omicron variant, I'll talk a little bit more about that in, in just a second. But as we, as we knew we were heading towards Omicron, and what's interesting about this one, too, is not just how fast it spreads within the community. I'll talk about that more in just a second as well. But how fast, fast it has spread across the country with other ways. Of course, we've seen it start uh, on the coast usually and kind of make its way in over the course of a month or so. Um, in, in this case, much more rapidly, in New York and Washington, D.C., where we saw the first exponential spikes, um, we're only a couple weeks ahead of Utah. And, uh, and, and, and that is true, again, of most states um, that are seeing the same types of, of numbers that, that we're seeing now. Um, and, and so we, as we, we met with our teams, and I, I, I so want to thank our health departments, our local health departments, and our partners who are, are in the testing uh, business, helping us to get people tested. 
And the, we knew that we could increase the number of tests from what, you know, an average usually in, in normal times around 10,000 a day, um, that it, in Delta we were getting up to 19, 20,000 a day and, and, and a little more than that. We knew we could get up to 45 to 50,000 tests a day. So we could, we could double that capacity or, or triple that capacity. Um, but we knew after that it would be, it would be difficult for, for a couple reasons. The biggest reason is just personnel. Um, we're, we're very blessed in this state to have an employment rate of 2.2%. Um, but uh, as you know, in every single industry, we're struggling to find employees, and that is true in testing as well. So we knew that we would have a capacity strain when it came to personnel. Our plan to make up for that was to use home testing kits so that when lines got longer, we would use those home testing kits for people so that they could go home, test, find out if they were if they were positive, and, uh, and then take the appropriate steps to quarantine if they were positive. Um, and so we, we had an extra supply of, of home testing kits. And that's what we were doing. It worked very well. Um, when lines got too long, we would use those home testing kits, and uh, and 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 lines got shorter, and, and people were mostly happy. Uh, and then something else changed there. So not only do we have a personnel shortage, um, but there is a testing shortage. The the normal supply of tests that we had already ordered uh, did not come to us, and so that uh, that became another constraint. And that is what what has led directly to the uh, the, the longer lines. Um, now we are hopeful that uh, that our back orders of tests will be coming in um, and that over the next week or two we'll be getting hundreds of thousands of the tests that we have ordered and and so our, our fingers are certainly crossed um, but in the meantime until those tests come, we have to look at things a little differently. And so uh, we, we challenged um, our, our health officials and uh, to, to advise us, to give us the, the, the best data they could on testing and, uh, and, and what we should do, how we should approach this moving forward. Um, I, I would also note that what we heard from them, and Dr. Nolan can speak to this much more and, and talk about the recommendations that they are giving to us and, and to us collectively as Utahns, is that um, the, the very nature of testing, I think it's important to remember, we, we don't do this type of testing with with really any other diseases right um, you, you we get sick um, we stay home hopefully and hopefully we'll do more of that that may be one of the positive lessons that comes out of this um, and then if we if we're we're we're, get, we're not getting better we go to the doctor and then they test us there to see what we have and then they 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 they, uh, they give us uh, the the appropriate medications to deal with that that's how we normally do this um, however the, the reason we do this mass testing the idea behind that was that we test people um, we find out if they have it and, and and again, with the original virus and, and alpha, the first variant, um there was, a, there was a delayed time frame for this to develop within people and then be passed on. So if we could test you and test you quickly when you had symptoms, we could find out if you had it, then we could contact the people that, that had been around you in the last few days and we could help them uh, to isolate as well so that we could we could slow the spread and we could stop the spread now what's different again and and we're we're still having alpha fights in an omicron world um, omicron is very very different uh, the the disease is much 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 more transmissible much more contagious so basically if you look at the the, the studies um, alpha was 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 two times more contagious than the, than the wild virus um, delta was two times more contagious than alpha and omicron is two to four times more contagious than, uh, than Delta. Um, and, and as humans, we're not really good at processing exponential growth. But uh, what, what we do know, there was a study done in Japan about Delta that basically we were shedding with Delta a thousand times more virus than, uh, than, than Alpha. That's, that's, that's an enormous change, right? Um, now, uh, and, and that, that made it two times more contagious. So, so we're looking at two to four times more contagious with, uh, with, with Omicron. Now we're talking about exponential, millions of times more virus that we're shedding with, with Omicron than with others, which makes it just, again, so explosive and super contagious and makes it much more harder to contain. It also moves through us much more quickly. So instead of taking you know, six days to, to from from contact to actually getting um, symptoms. Now we're, we're talking two days. So by the time people are getting tested, they've already infected a whole bunch of people who have already infected a whole bunch of people. And our ability to contact trace with numbers like this uh, is, is just virtually impossible. And so, so that, that, that changes the, the, the value of testing. Um, now, there, there is some good news. 
And uh, the, the good news is that we have much more data uh, about Omicron and its effect on people. And so what, what we do know, some new numbers came out yesterday that said that if you, if you control for everything else, you control for, um, you, you control for vaccination, you control for uh, previous infection, you control for all of those things, it looks like Omicron is 25% less severe than, uh, than, than, than Delta. That's really good news, right? That's good news. But we, we also have so much more of it. Now, the other good news, though, is that we have many, many more people vaccinated. Um, close to 70 percent, well, a little more than 70 percent of Utahns 12 and older um, are fully vaccinated. That's, that's great news. That's what we didn't have with prior, prior versions of, of this virus. Um, we also have more people that have had other versions of this virus. Um, and so all of those things are, are helping to lower hospitalizations and lower deaths. We also know that with Omicron, um, it tends to be in the upper respiratory system much more than in the lungs and uh, that that we're seeing here in Utah we talked to some of our hospitals yesterday to get an update on them on what they're seeing on the ground and they said well the good news is that most of our ICU patients right now are are, are leftover Delta patients people who had the the Delta variant um, and and they're they, they 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 had to go to the ICU and they're staying much longer they said we are seeing also what we're seeing nationally, and that is people with the Omicron variant, their stays in the hospital are significantly shorter. There was one study that was done a couple days ago that showed that the average Delta stay was, uh, was four plus days. The average Omicron stay is a day and a half. So that's good news because our throughput can get, get much, much, we, we can get through more people in the hospital, get them out, get them healthy, get them back on their feet. So that's also very positive news. Now, the, the, the downside is that there's just so much more of it. So even if the, the per case rate of hospitalization is significantly lower, which it is for all of the reasons I mentioned, the actual, the raw number of people getting hospitalized is actually higher because there's so much of it. Now, we, we do have hospital beds, and, and again, uh, our ICU capacity is not being taxed with Omicron the way it was with Delta. Um, the problem is, as I mentioned, because this is so much more contagious and because traditional measures to prevent the spread of this, this, uh, this variant don't work as well, many more of our um, our nurses and doctors and those that work in the hospital system are also getting this despite despite mask wearing and all of those other things they're catching omicron which means that that they're out for five days and uh, and that leads to staffing shortages so so I, I think it's just important that we understand again the changing nature of the virus what's different about this one versus others and and how we can pre protect ourselves now the, the last thing i want to say about that and this is the best news of, of all and that is that while, um, while we've looked across the country to see if, if other interventions are, are working and we can't find that other interventions are working the way they have in the past, what we do find that is working are vaccinations and booster shots. If you look at our hospitals in Utah and across the country, um, people who are vaccinated and people who are boosted are not going to the hospital in, in nearly the numbers. It's, it's a very small fraction of the numbers of those who are unvaccinated. And, uh, and so when we are looking at something that works against Omicron, that will protect you from severe illness, from being hospitalized and, and dying, um, it is still vaccines and boosters. And we greatly encourage you to do that. Now, the last thing I'll mention before turning it over to, uh, to Dr. Nolan, um, we are seeing this spread uh, through our schools and uh, those same limitations that we have on staffing and the number of tests available impact us in our ability to, uh, to deliver tests and our test to stay program in schools. Uh, we, uh, my, my, my own daughter's uh, class, had a, her, her school had a test to stay event uh, a couple days ago. Uh, she, she messaged me and said, hey, um, the good news is I tested negative. Um, the bad news is, uh, for any of you Marvel comic fans out there, it was a little bit like the Thanos snap. She said, we, we did a test to stay event and all of a sudden half my class was gone um, because they, they had tested positive. Um, we're seeing this um, in schools that that have, uh, that have masking requirements as well as schools that don't. This severe spread is impacting all of our schools. And it's also impacting our, our teachers as well, our educators, and making it hard for them uh, when they test positive and have to quarantine for, for five days. So this, this is very serious. And, uh, and so we, we also 
tasked our public health officials to come and, and give us their best recommendations on what we can do in schools, given the fact that we have limited tests available and we have a limited staffing for, for that to happen. Um, I would just note that, that the, uh, the, the recommendations that we're getting are the same recommendations that are happening in states all across the country. Um, I've been talking to fellow governors, we've been talking to fellow public health officials in the, uh, in, in the West, Intermountain West and, and elsewhere. I uh, had a great conversation with a couple governors uh, yesterday in Arizona and, uh, and in Arkansas, and, and they're, they're having these, these very same conversations and receiving similar recommendations. Um, and I'm so grateful for the leadership of our public health officials. Um, Dr. Nolan, who you haven't seen as much, uh, who came in for Dr. Dunn when Dr. Dunn went to Salt Lake County. Um, she has been a tremendous resource and filled those very large shoes that, uh, that Dr. Dunn left behind. Um, I, I want to thank um, our, our, everyone at the Department of Health, um, Nate and his team who have worked so hard uh, to continue to advise us through these difficult times, and, and to all of those who are working in public health, um, all of the doctors, the nurses, those who are um, running testing sites, thank you for your diligence. Uh, we, we know that Omicron comes down as fast as it goes up. We're hopeful that in the next couple of weeks we will reach our peak as, as New York and D.C. and those other states are, have done and, and, and are heading back down. But until then, um, we're going to get some additional recommendations on how we can get through this, this testing crunch and get us through the next few weeks. So with that, I'll turn the podium over to Dr. Nolan. Thank you, Governor Cox. Um, and thank you all for uh, coming to listen and, and hear about these advisements. So there's two main changes that we're talking about today. And these are temporary changes, but I think things that are really important to affect our public health um, actions here in Utah. So the first change we're, we're doing today is that we're recommending people who have symptoms, they really should stay home, act as if they have COVID, and not necessarily need to go get testing. The second change is that we're putting tests on stay on hold um, under advisement with uh, Governor Cox, Speaker Wilson, and President Adams. So first, I, I want to address like how can we make these changes. I think Governor Cox already gave us some information, but you've heard for two years that we keep on telling people, go get testing, go get testing. How can we suddenly say, it's not as important to get testing. And it is, it's a lot what Governor Cox just told us. There are so many cases going around now, we know if you have symptoms, you most likely have COVID. And so the benefit of getting that test is really decreased. What is more important is keeping you away from other people so you don't transmit it. If you wait to get tested, there's that time where you're gonna be able to go to spread it to other people, and really that isn't working right now. So instead of getting tested, instead of going out and exposing more people, we recommend anyone who has symptoms stays home, isolates for five days. And we would ask you to act as if you are a confirmed COVID case. You isolate for five days. On day six, if you're feeling better, if you don't have a fever, it's reasonable to go back into society wearing a mask for another five days. So. What else can we say? Why are we doing this? Uh, Governor Cox uh, mentioned it really well. Um, we have limited testing capacity. We have stretched so far. We've done everything we can to increase what we can do to test, and still there's more people needing to be tested. We know there's huge lines. And so what we want to do is use our testing capacity to maximize what we need to do. There's certain groups of people who are, more, it's more valuable to test than the general population. So that's why we're recommending most people to to stay home, isolate, even if they aren't able to go get a test. So um, one thing we want to point out is who should get a, a test. And so there are certain people who should still definitely go get those tests. And those are people who have significant underlying conditions. So right now, our treatment options in Utah are quite limited. It's limited in the entire US. Unfortunately, Omicron has taken out a few of the medications, the monoclonal antibodies that we were able to treat Delta with. Right now, we don't have those because Omicron is resistant to those. But there is still a value. If you have significant underlying conditions, if you're elderly, we do recommend you still go get tested so that you can understand what your risk is. Maybe you will have some treatments. And maybe you don't have COVID. Maybe you have something else, and it would be good for you to know so your doctor can get other treatments for you. 
Also, we recommend people who are working with vulnerable populations still go get testing. And that's because we do not want those people exposed. Um, we want to make sure that our elderly people in long-term care facilities, that hospitals are not uh, spreading COVID around. So people who work with uh, vulnerable populations, who work in healthcare, who work in long-term care facilities, we still encourage them strongly to go get testing. And then we also encourage people who are going to visit vulnerable individuals to get testing. We certainly, if you're going to go see your grandmother, if you're going to go see someone who's on chemotherapy, we want to make sure you don't accidentally take COVID to them. And therefore, those are the kind of people we would also recommend testing for. And last, there is a reason if you are someone who's been symptomatic, you're getting better, you're thinking about going back into the community, that's a time where maybe it is reasonable to go get a test. Um, but I want to repeat, if, if you're symptomatic, we encourage you to assume you have COVID. It is so common right now, it's very likely that you do. And it's not necessary for you to get tested. And instead, stay home, isolate for five days, act as if you are, in fact, COVID positive. So that's what we're recommending for the general population. But as I mentioned, we're also changing what um, our approach is right now for a test to stay. And this is a temporary change. Um, the legislature is going to be evaluating this more thoroughly next week. But for now, we're putting test to stay on hold. And for those of people who aren't so familiar with what to test to stay is, it's the school approach where when a school hits a certain number of cases, um, we do a testing of everyone in the school. So as Governor Cox said, right now that doesn't work so well because we hit that number of cases in the school and we realize when we do that test to stay, a huge number of kids in the school are already positive. The idea is that we did that event to stop the spread, but actually we're behind the ball. For example, in Davis, we had schools yesterday test with 250 kids turn out positive. That means we're doing it too late. And so test to stay really isn't doing what we need it to do. We wanted it to stop the spread it's behind, it's not able to stop the spread. So for that reason, for the next few days, we're putting a pause on test to stay. Um, the legislature um, will be looking at what to do um, starting next week about what to do going forward. Um, there has been the option opened up that now schools can do a four day um, remote learning to be able to sort of counteract some of this spread. Um, so we, we local health departments, everyone will be working together to evaluate what a school can do when they are seeing more cases to be able to um, prevent that spread. And then last, um, I do want to mention that we are reaching out to um, groups that are holding events or businesses that have um, requirements that people test in order to come to their event or to, to work. Right now, the Utah Department of Health, in fact, the entire system doesn't really have the capacity to do those mass testings and mass screenings. And so we are asking those organizations to reevaluate what they're doing in terms of their approach to prevent infection. We recognize it's really useful to um, test people to make sure you don't have spread in your event, but right now that's very difficult. So we encourage people to look at their event. Is it something that could be delayed? Can a business turn to remote work? Are there other precautions that can be put in place while we're not able to do that testing? Um, some places have been able to get their own testing resources. For example, the Jazz are doing their own testing. If that's possible, we encourage that. But as of right now, um, the, the Department of Health and the state resources aren't able to support that level of mass testing. And then the last thing for those businesses or events, I, I think the important thing is to encourage what we all are encouraging everyone, is that if you have symptoms, you shouldn't come to that event. You shouldn't come to that business. You should stay home um, and, and wait until you're better. So with that, I'm going to turn this over to Superintendent Dixon so she can talk more about what's happening in our schools right now. Thank you, Dr. Nolan, and good morning, everybody. I first want to start by thanking the adults who work in our public education system. They have done a yeoman's job of trying to keep all of our students learning in person, which is optimal. We see you, we hear you, we know you're physically and mentally exhausted, and we're so appreciative of all the adaptation that has occurred to ensure that our students can stay in school. So I want to spend a little bit of time doubling down on remarks of the governor and of Dr. Nolan and talk about what we're seeing on the ground and then how these actions will help us. Um, you've already heard about the increase in cases in our schools and it's, it happens 
so quickly. Consequently, we've been, um, we've been running into operational challenges, and as more and more students and educators and staff have had to stay home to either recover from COVID or um, they've been exposed. Recently, one school district in Utah saw nearly one out of every six of its full-time employees absent for health or other reasons. This led to long delays at some of the district's bus routes and a depletion of the availability of substitute teachers. We ended up with classes in gymnasiums, um, teachers combining two or three classes together, and therefore just really not only putting stress on the system, but not creating conditions of optimal learning. Another school district reported significant student and staff absenteeism um, due to a spike to the point where they only had about a quarter of their students in attendance. So as you've heard from Dr. Nolan, test to stay events this week have experienced rates that nearly up to one in seven of the total school population have tested positive. So unfortunately, these numbers, as you've heard, continue to be on the rise and action needs to be taken to ensure that our schools remain safe and functional. So these actions will help in that one of our primary goals, of course, is to keep um, our students safe, provide healthy schools. And when schools experience these high COVID cases and transmission um, creates situations where they can no longer really learn, we need to do something to get back on track as quickly as possible. This stresses our families, it stresses our economy when our students are out of school, and it's hard on our teachers and our students. Utah's invested an enormous amount of money in digital teaching and learning. We're so grateful to be leaders in this field uh, by the investment of our legislature. And so we do have sources for remote instruction to prepare our um, students and, and um, be able to respond in a very nimble manner to the pandemic. It's not something we want to do in a permanent way, um, of course, but we do have tools available to, to put out into our homes and to be able to interact with their teachers during these very brief periods of remote learning. We believe that by giving schools and staff a chance to pause and reset, as one school district put it, we can slow the transmission and we'll be able to get our students back to their classrooms for higher quality education in a safe and healthy environment. Thank you. Thank you, Superintendent, for all you do. Um, it's good to be with you today under these trying circumstances, everyone. Um, just want to maybe reiterate what has been said and, and share some perspective uh, from the President Adams and myself. We appreciate working with uh, all of these great state leaders. This pandemic has proven to be anything but predictable. Uh, and we all recognize that we need to be very flexible and adaptable as we move through this current wave. Um, and as the governor so articulately described, this wave has looked a lot different uh, than its predecessors over the last uh, 22 months. It's spreading rapidly uh, and it's infecting or affecting uh, nearly every Utah right now. With that, uh, the pivot that's been described today, uh, we think is the right approach and the right strategy uh, to deal with this uh, over the next uh, month or two as we deal with this Omicron version of, of COVID. And uh, I just wanna reiterate uh, what Dr. Nolan said. Uh, if you have symptoms, uh, just assume that you have COVID and uh, stay home for five days. Uh, and then mask up uh, after that uh, for the following five days. And please, please save the tests for those uh, at-risk individuals that Dr. Nolan has described or those that are proximate to, to at-risk individuals. And, uh, uh, and if you are one of those, uh, we do encourage you to go out uh, and get a test and, and make sure that you're taking good, good care of yourself. Uh, also, uh, as has been described, uh, we've been working over the last couple days uh, and we've announced that the test to stay program has been paused and uh, the legislature uh, uh, has worked hard uh, to put that in place and it worked really well to get our kids in school and keep them in school safely over the course of the last, uh, the last 22 months. But um, we will, as a legislature, uh, be looking uh, at what to do with that program and working closely with Dr. Nolan, uh, Governor Cox, and others to figure out what the right path forward is uh, with test, test to stay. Uh, government, as we all know, doesn't get to decide how pandemics behave and how they spread across uh, our state and across the world. And we're trying to be as nimble uh, as possible in order to address the current needs uh, of the state of Utah. And trust me, uh, 
none of us uh, want to be here talking about COVID or viruses or masks or tests ever again, uh, but uh, it is the, the, the time we still need to be doing that. So the legislature uh, starts next Tuesday. And, and as we get uh, to doing the people's work, we aren't really sure uh, how Omicron is going to affect uh, our ability to conduct uh, the legislative session. Uh, but you should know that we are absolutely committed uh, to doing the work of the people of the state of Utah. And we also recognize that we may have to make some adjustments uh, along the way uh, as we navigate this. Um, like the governor, uh, I'm hopeful that this peak, uh, uh, this virus is about to peak here in the state of Utah and that we see a decline in cases uh, shortly. And I just would reiterate what's also been said, which is ask each of us to do our part uh, to make sure that we're, we're helping with that. Lastly, and this is probably the most important thing, at least from my perspective, uh, I would be remiss uh, if I didn't thank all the heroes that have been helping the state over the last couple of years uh, during this pandemic. Uh, our healthcare workers, our teachers, uh, the parents, the students that have uh, had very disrupted learning over the last two years, and the frontline workers, uh, their incredible adaptability and unwavering resiliency uh, over this pandemic uh, has really made a big difference for everyone in our state. And while it may not feel this way right now, uh, I'm confident uh, that brighter days are ahead uh, and soon. So, thank you. Uh, thank you. I uh, appreciate the participation here. Um, we will have some time for a, a few questions and invite Governor Cox to, to come and answer those. And you can ask to, to anyone up here if you'd like. Thank you. Thank you, Lieutenant Governor. Questions? Seeing none. <laughs> what do you say to people about masks when there's been such a strange discord about it in different counties and you know even among you some are wearing them some are not sure yeah, I, I, I would say the same thing I've been saying for uh, for the last year, and, and that is um, that, well, it, it again, th this virus has changed. I, I already mentioned that, um, and and that exponential change is, is hard for people to understand. W what we do know for sure, and there is now broad agreement, is that against Omicron, and, and this, it's so hard to change um, our mindset from previous variants. It's not that we change, it's that the virus change. So what we know is that that cloth masks do not work at all. I saw one national expert who said they're window dressing. Uh, so, so a cloth mask doesn't doesn't do anything. Um, most experts now are are. are looking at the, uh, the disposable surgical masks and saying it, we're against Omicron, they, they, they probably don't work as, as well as they did against past variants for, for the reasons I already mentioned. So uh, again, there's, we're, we're shedding millions more uh, uh, higher viral load th than we were before. What, what masks do is they, they, they limit the distance at which our aerosols and um, it, it, the, our, our, our breath really spreads, right? And, and we're shedding those viruses, so we're trying to limit the amount of that. But when you have millions times more, and it stays in the air, a new study just said for approximately 20 minutes, um, that, that that's out there, even, even with a mask. And, uh, and so surgical masks, as unfortunately we're seeing with our healthcare workers who are very good at wearing surgical masks all day um, and, and are still getting infected, it probably aren't as effective either. That's why the recommendation right now is, is for N95 masks. And e even before public health officials were recommending N95 masks, I was, I, I believe that they are the, the only uh, way to help limit sp spread, especially Especially with with Omicron and, and even then it depends on how you wear them so th this idea that we wear masks and we go into a restaurant and then we take our masks off and we eat and drink and somehow the virus knows not to infect us during those times um, that that's that's not a thing um, every time you're in a room and you see somebody kind of pull down their mask to kind of catch their breath now we have viral spread uh, and again the most contagious virus that, that we've seen in our in our lifetimes um, and so w what I would say is um, again we all have to make these calculations if you are 
If you are vaxxed and you are boosted and, and you are a healthy person, um, you, you make a decision uh, based on, on that information. If you are at risk if you, or, or you are around people that are at risk, and by the way, the most at risk people right now are those who are not vaccinated, um, then, then an N95 mask makes, could make a significant difference and, uh, and, and really help you. And so that, that's, that's my message. I, I know it's confusing when we hear, well, you know, p the things keep changing. And they're right, the virus keeps changing. And that's hard for us to keep up with, but that's, that's what we, we know that these, these work, they, they don't have as much uh, effectiveness against, uh, as they did against prior variants, but um, they, they might do something. Other questions? All right, we have been listening to state leaders, including the governor there, talk about just how different this virus, this strain of the virus is. And because of that, having to make changes, adapt, and kind of create a new strategy for going forward. So he, as well as the other leaders, talked about two big changes that are or recommendations that they're making right now. And that is, if you feel sick, if you're showing any of the symptoms of Omicron, chances are you do probably have it. And so they're saying just stay home, isolate for five days, and then go back to work wearing a mask for five more days. There is a shortage of tests right now, so they're asking those tests be reserved for people um, who really need it, people vulnerable populations that might need to test. And then the other uh, thing that we heard there was the test to stay. They are putting that on temporary hold as well because of the shortage of tests. So we learned a lot and just learning that we had to con we have to continue to change as this virus changes. April? Yeah, they're also mentioning about businesses as well and how they should evaluate their COVID protocols if they have an upcoming event, they should evaluate if they can delay that event or if it needs to be held right now, just taking the, making businesses responsible for what they're doing and keeping their employees safe as well. So the legislature, as mentioned, will be meeting next week about the test to state protocol. So we'll learn more about that. And of course, we'll be following any updates for you on air and online at fox13now.com. And we're gonna have more live at 11 coming up as well.